All right, it's 635. Let's go ahead and get started. Greetings, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third seminar in the Science in the News Spring Seminar Series. We're incredibly excited to present our speaker this week, Zhao Han Wu. Zhao Han is a PhD student in astronomy and astrophysics here at Harvard, and tonight she will tell us about the role of gas and light in the early universe. This evening's talk will have three parts, and at the end of each section, we will pause for questions and take a short break. If you have any questions during the talk, feel free to type them in the chat, and we will relay them to Zhao Han. Without any further ado, I will turn it over to Zhao Han presenting the first light of the universe, piercing through the gas in between galaxies and lighting everything up. Okay, uh, thank you, Manji, for the introduction. Uh, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a fifth year grad student here at Harvard. Uh, and then today's topic uh, is about the first light of the universe. And I actually showed the same topic uh, in the downstairs PhD competition this year, and I won the physics we'll relate prize. Them to uh, I'm also going to briefly show a piece of the video uh, during this talk. But uh, if you're interested in the video, you can absolutely just Google me and Google downstairs PhD. Uh, yeah, so let's get started. Uh, so first of all, we know that we know that the universe is filled with galaxies. And in particular, uh, one type of galaxy that we are most familiar with is the spiral galaxy, because our own Milky Way is a spiral galaxy. So for instance, this one, uh, this is actually M101, but the Milky Way looks uh, pretty much similar. Uh, and we know that uh, these spiral galaxies are star forming galaxies, uh, which means uh, they are actively, actively forming stars. And if we zoom in to one of the uh, spiral arms, we can see there are this kind of um, feature where, uh, the, uh, where the stars are forming uh, within the gas. Uh, and so this is a pretty famous picture, uh, which is the pillars of creation uh, taken within the Milky Way. So uh, you can see uh, stars are forming in these uh, gas. And then uh, when they form, they expel the gas uh, so that they form this kind of a finger-like uh, structure. Uh, and then of course, there are a lot of other galaxy types in the universe, uh, in addition to spiral galaxy, such as the irregular galaxy shown here. And there are also uh, elliptical galaxies, for instance, the very famous M81, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, M81, uh, sorry, M87. Uh, yeah, so this is um, the galaxy where the uh, Event Horizon Telescope takes the picture of, a, of the black hole. Uh, but we are only going to care about uh, the ultra faint dwarf galaxies. So this is a type of galaxy which is very different from the spiral galaxies, because um, as you can see from this example, this is called Leo 4. And then uh, there's actually um, a region here that uh, there are more stars than the background galaxy, uh, sorry, the background stars, even though you probably can't really see that. Uh, so uh, I think uh, maybe, it, it, uh, maybe it's the computers that actually made the detection of an overdense uh, stars, not really by human eye. Yeah, but um, when you look at uh, this one, uh, which is a, uh, uh, on the, uh, the right-hand side, this is a zoom in of this region. You see that this is very different from the spiral because there are so few stars in this region. And then this region looks also quite dead, which means there are not uh, so many stars forming compared to like the spiral arms, which look really blue, which means there are a lot of stars forming. So, uh, so uh, if we, uh, look even more closely. Uh, so this is like uh, separating the background galaxies and stars and comparing to the stars that actually belong to Leo 4. Uh, so uh, you can actually see that uh, there are only like uh, a few thousand stars in this galaxy. Uh, while in the spiral galaxy, we may have like a trillion stars. Uh, and so the question, um, the question, uh, yeah, and, and also if we like, um, sorry, I'm gonna move this to here. Okay, this is better. Yeah, so if we do a um, age measurements for these stars, we actually find that uh, these stars are all, uh, they have very long ages. So uh, they are like about 
the, the stars all, they all formed about uh, 13 billion years ago. And if we compare to that, uh, compare that uh, the age of the stars to the age of the universe, which is like 13.8 billion years, we realize that there are really not new stars forming since uh, since a very long time ago. So uh, we really want to ask, um, uh, ask the question, like what stopped the star, the star formation in this galaxy about 13 billion years ago? And to answer this question, uh, we have to look at the gas in the universe. So we know that, uh, again, the universe is full of galaxies uh, and we can really see them with the naked eye, uh, but there are actually a lot of gas in between the galaxies which are very low density. So how low is that density? Uh, it's roughly about one atom per cubic meter. Uh, and comparing that to the gas of, uh, uh, sorry, compare, comparing that to the density of the, uh, the air on earth, which is about uh, 10 to the 25 molecules per cubic meter. This is really like extremely low density. Uh, so we say that the, uh, the density of the, uh, the gas in between galaxies is very diffuse. And then if we do like a visualization of the gas, which we uh, absolutely cannot see with a naked eye. Uh, so that's roughly il illustrated by the right hand plot here by the uh, gray green regions. And then the galaxies, these are marked by the sort of orange colors in this plot. Yeah, so you see like in this way, we can really visualize the gas in the universe in between galaxies, but we can't actually see them with the naked eye. Yeah, so uh, in order to uh, answer this previous question, what stopped the star formation in these ultra faint dwarf galaxies 13, 13 billion years ago, we have to look at a process that happens in the gas, which is called uh, the reionization process. Uh, so the story is that uh, what we observe now uh, is that the gas in between galaxies, they are hot and transparent, where transparent means that if uh, we have a background star and then the star shoots um, light across the gas, then the light should be able to pass through the gas. Uh, but then we think that the gas in between the galaxies should be cold and opaque when the universe was in its dark ages. Uh, the dark ages means that uh, there is no star at the beginning uh, so uh, basically uh, cold and opaque means that if we have a, again this uh, background star and then the star shoot lights uh, on the gas, then the gas will not allow the, the lights to pass through. So um, here this plot illustrates the, um, the evolution of the universe. And then from left to right, this is showing the uh, time evolution. So at the beginning, you see the Big Bang and then you have the dark ages where there's no star. Uh, and then you have the first star uh, formation about uh, a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. And then here now uh, the age of the universe is like 13.8 billion years. Uh, so there really is like a huge transition between uh, the state of the gas when it's in the dark ages compared to the state of the gas um, like uh, in the present day. And then this tra uh, huge transition from uh, cold and opaque to hot and transparent, we call that the epoch of reionization. And we think this epoch of reionization should have occurred when the universe was like hundreds of millions of uh, years old. Yeah, so um, our whole talk is going to be about this epoch of reionization. And then uh, I'm going to divide into three parts. Uh, the first part is going to deal with how can the gas actually transition from being opaque to hot and transparent. Uh, and then the second part is going to talk about um, how this transition occur throughout the universe. Uh, and then the third part, we are going to uh, actually go back to the uh, question that we posed at the beginning about the ultra faint dwarfs. Uh, so, uh, which is basically going to tell us uh, the implications of studying reionization. And also, of course, we're going to deal with how we actually study reionization. Yeah, so let's first talk about um, how can the gas transition from being cold and opaque to hot and transparent. Uh, but before we talk about that, we have to deal with, uh, first of all, what is the gas made of? 
So in the diffuse gas in between galaxies, 75% uh, 70, of the gas is made of hydrogen. So hydrogen is basically one proton plus one electron, uh, which is shown by this plot here. And then um, in this plot, you also see like um, the electron, which is, which is represented by the blue, uh, blue circle here. It's sort of a circle around the proton, which, re which is represented, represented by the uh, red circle here. So when uh, the plot is like drawn in this way, like uh, uh, drawn with a circle, what is specifically telling us is that the electron is attached to the proton. And in, in this state, we call this hydrogen atom a neutral hydrogen atom. Uh, and also there's of course uh, another state where the hydrogen atom is not neutral. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, so the story is that if we give this, this system, this, uh, this um, proton electron system energy, and if, this is, if the system absorbs this energy, then we are able to break the attachment of the, uh, we, are, we are able to break the bond between the electron and the proton. So um, after we give this system the energy and then it absorbs the energy, we see like the, uh, the bond between the proton and the electron is broken. So now uh, the electron and proton, they are free to travel, which is indicated by the arrows here. And then we say in this state, uh, this not bound state, the hydrogen atoms, uh, the hydrogen atom is ionized. So this is still called hydrogen, but it's, it is just ionized hydrogen. Yeah. So now uh, let's put what we um, said before together. Uh, now uh, we have this uh, on the left. Uh, this is like uh, a collection of hydrogen atoms, and then this. Uh, you see the circles here. So this is uh, neutral hydrogen. And then on the right, this is ionized hydrogen uh, because you don't see the circles around the proton and the electron. And, the, uh, and then now uh, the transition from neutral to ionized, we need energy. So uh, the new thing I'm going to mention here is that when we give the system energy and it absorbs the energy, uh, the gas is still going to be heated up because of this energy input. And then, uh, uh, so now we uh, are basically transitioning the gas from being cold to hot uh, because of this energy absorption. And then in physics, uh, what cold and hot means is basically uh, how much the uh, atoms are allowed to travel. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it's velocity. So basically in this cold state, uh, all of the um, hydrogen atoms, they travel pretty, uh, pretty slowly uh, compared to like hydrogen atoms in the hot state, like all the electrons and uh, protons, they are allowed to travel like very fast. Uh, and the reason is this energy input. Uh, and what's, uh, what does cold and hot mean uh, in, uh, in a more quantitative way? Well, in terms of the diffuse gas in between galaxies, cold basically means that the, uh, the temperature of the gas is roughly about minus 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, and actually in astronomy, minus 100 is not so much different from like plus 100. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just the same in astronomy. And then what hot means in, in terms of the diffuse gas in between galaxies is that it is, it is about 10,000 degrees Celsius. So it is, it is really like orders of magnitude change in, ter, uh, in the temperature of the gas. Uh, and uh, in order to transition from uh, neutral to ionized, I mentioned about energy inputs and that energy input has to come from the UV light. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, and the UV light comes from stars. Uh, so here's a, uh, 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 here's an illustration of like the electromagnetic uh, radiation. And then you see like electromagnetic radiation, they have like um, different wavelengths. So the visible wavelength, wavelength is roughly here. So these are the wavelengths that we can actually see by the naked eye. And uh, for the radiation that can be absorbed by 
neutral hydrogen atoms, these are the uh, what we call the ultraviolets or even uh, even the shorter wavelengths. So these are like uh, the wavelengths roughly um, separated here. So um, roughly rightward of uh, this range, uh, these are the wavelengths of light that can be absorbed by, uh, by neutral hydrogen. Uh, and also, uh, so we say that these, oh, I'm not sure what's happening here. Yeah, but these are like, um, where am I? Sorry, give me a second. Yeah, so so we see uh, so we say that these lights they can ionize hydrogen, and then for the lights uh, leftwards of this range, so these are what we call the uh, non ionized non ionizing light. So these lights cannot ionize hydrogen because the 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 energy is not enough. The wavelength is too long. And then we are going to use this uh, like uh, uh, wave, uh, wave, uh, wave kind of feature with a uh, with a dot connected to it to represent light. So you also we also sometimes call it photon, but you don't have to worry about photon uh, at this time. I'm just going to call it the UV light. Yeah. So basically, to put everything together. Uh, how do we transition from neutral to ionized for a single hydrogen atom? So we first have to uh, have stars, and then the star is going to emit uh, UV light. The UV light carries energy. So when it hits a neutral hydrogen atom, the neutral hydrogen atom will absorb this energy from the, uh, the UV light. And that is going to um, uh, break the bond between the proton and the, and the electron. So uh, these two things are set free from each other. And then because the system absorbed energy, uh, that's going to heat up this system. So uh, the electron and uh, proton, they are free to travel uh, with a, a higher velocity, uh, which is uh, uh, a much higher velocity than they are allowed to travel before. Uh, so that's going to uh, transition um, basically from a cold and neutral state to hot and ionized states. And hot means uh, 10,000 degrees Celsius. Yeah, so uh, yeah, that's basically the end of the uh, part one. And then there's a, there's, this is just a brief summary of what I talked about. And then in the next part, we are going to talk about uh, how this transition from neutral to ionized happened throughout the universe. Uh, but uh, let's first take some questions. Fantastic. That was great. So uh, for anyone watching on the Zoom or on the YouTube, please feel free to type any questions that you have into the chat um, and we'll relay them to Xiao Han. And since we don't have any questions yet, um, I'll start off with a question. I was wondering um, at the very beginning uh, for that image of the spiral galaxy and the ultra faint dwarf galaxy, are those on the same scale? Oh, yeah, definitely not the same scale. Um, yeah, because like um, the size of the galaxies are very different. Uh, the spiral galaxy has about like a trillion stars, but the ultra faint dwarfs, it has only uh, a few thousand stars. So um, it's really like we are, we are just making the images like roughly the same size so that you can see them. But in reality, the sizes are going to be like orders of magnitude difference. Cool. And I guess in a related question, are there galaxies that are sort of in between these two types that have an intermediate number of stars that like also maybe stopped forming stars, but at a later time than the dwarf galaxy? Yeah, yeah. So I think the irregular galaxy is one kind of, uh, galaxy that falls in between. So it has a um, mass that is in between a spiral galaxy and the ultra faint dwarf. Uh, but it's like the, the, the halt of the star formation didn't, um, didn't occur as early as 13 billion years ago. But it's like continuously star forming, but just not uh, so actively star forming as the spiral. 
then in addition to the ultra faint dwarf, there is also just normal dwarf galaxies. And these are also like continuously star forming, but not uh, just not as so active as the spiral and not so um, extreme as the, the, the hold of the star formation in ultra faint dwarfs. Great. And then also do things like gamma rays also ionize gas? Uh, yes, they do. Um, but there's, um, uh, you have to consider like the, the probability of being ionized. Uh, so the story is uh, when the gas, is, uh, sorry, when the wavelength of the light is closer to like this range, then it's way easier to ionize the gas. Uh, the X-rays and gamma rays, they can also ionize hydrogen, but it's like the probability is way lower. Wow, that, that's interesting. So um, if we don't have any other questions, we'll take a few minute break and then we'll come back at uh, 6.59 to start the second part of the talk. Okay, it's oh, it's 6.59. So let's go ahead and get started with the second part. Okay. Yeah, so, so now we can basically talk about how um, this uh, thing called reionization happens. Uh, and then we are certainly going to explain what reionization is uh, or recap. But uh, first of all, just a quick recap of the first parts. Uh, we mentioned that in order to transition the neutral hydrogen from uh, being neutral to uh, highly ionized, we need uh, uh, like uh, stars and UV light. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, so basically they are the, the three players of reionization uh, or just the, the game of the uh, ionization. Uh, but first of all, uh, in, in order to play this game, we have to have star formation because at the beginning of the universe, there are no stars. Uh, so uh, it is in this so-called dark ages, we really don't have any stars forming. The first star formation occurred like uh, a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. Uh, so the story is that uh, in order to have star formation, we need just a tiny little bit of fluctuation in the initial uh, matter density field. Uh, so here uh, I'm showing the, the density field of uh, the matter distribution. So by density field, I'm basically referring to the, the map of the density uh, or the, the map of the matter distribution in the universe. And then you see like the slightly uh, more yellow colors. These are the higher density regions. And then the blue or the color is, these are the lower density regions. But this is uh, like magnified for like orders of magnitude for people to see. In reality, the fluctuations in the original uh, matter distribution is like extremely small. But we only need this very small uh, density fluctuation in order to form uh, structures in the universe. And the trick is we have gravity. So here gravity basically means the force that pulls things together. So it is the same as the force that pulls the apple downward to the center of the earth. Uh, and then we just here use the term gravity to uh, say the force that uh, try to pull that uh, pull things together. Uh, so uh, I have a movie here just to illustrate how the initial tiny uh, density fluctuation transition to uh, becoming structures in the universe that we see today. So let's play this movie. So you see like initially there is this tiny density fluctuations and then the things that have slightly higher density like this one, this is going to pull matter uh, towards it so that the density around this kind of structure is higher and higher over time. 
So you see the color becomes more yellow over time. And then also um, conversely, the color of this region is going to be more bluer over time uh, because matter is pulled uh, all to this kind of region and then away from this bluer region, which is initially of low density. Yeah, so eventually uh, we will see that it is these higher density regions that form the uh, initial stars and galaxies. Yeah, so yeah, so that's um, that's showing the the last snapshot of the movie I just showed, uh, and then uh, as I mentioned, the star and galaxy formation these are going to occur in the densest region of the universe. So that's uh, the yellowest region in this snapshot. And then uh, I want you to notice the, the scale of the uh, visualization I just showed object, which I didn't really mention, but the scale is really like 6 billion light years, um, which is the, the size of this uh, image. So uh, what this is saying is that in regions like this, uh, there are really going to be like tens or thousands or even millions of stars forming instead of just one star forming. Uh, and then, uh, so basically in this kind of scale, we are not really going to care about uh, in, uh, the formation of individual stars, but like collections of stars. And then galaxies are basically collections of stars. So what I'm saying is that in when you talk about the scale of the universe, we are not going to talk about stars anymore, but just galaxies. And so, uh, I'm basically uh, here uh, substituting the, the densest region of the universe with like images of galaxies to indicate there are galaxies forming. And then from here on, uh, I'm also going to switch to talking about galaxies, not individual stars, even though you know that uh, galaxies are basically collections of stars. Yeah, so now we can uh, talk about reionization. Uh, and reionization, uh, uh, let's recap. It is the transition of the gas in the universe from being cold and neutral at the beginning to the hot and highly ionized states that we observe now. And this uh, epoch of reionization, we believe, uh, is, uh, should have happened when the universe was like hundreds of millions of years old. So now let's take a look at how this whole uh, reionization process actually happens. Uh, so, first of all, yeah, as we uh, mentioned before, the transition from being cold and neutral to hot and ionized is just uh, a battle between the UV light and uh, hydrogen atoms. So here we see that this galaxy uh, it emits UV light towards a bunch of uh, neutral hydrogen atoms out here, and so when the UV light hits each of the hydrogen atom, the hydrogen atom will absorb the UV light and then become ionized. So that's illustrated by um, uh, these uh, 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 red and blue circles here. And then again, we don't have the um, this kind of circle around the uh, red uh, circle, which is the, the, the proton, which basically means the, the, ga uh, the gas is ionized and the bond between the proton and the electron is broken. And now we see that uh, the, uh, we actually create a boundary between the ionized gas and the neutral gas. And we, uh, we say in this kind of states, we create a ionized bubble. So the ionized bubble basically means all the uh, ionized gas uh, within this range. And then you see this kind of a, 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 a clear boundary here. And then after uh, this uh, region is ionized, these ionized hydrogen, they are not going to absorb UV light anymore, which basically means that the UV, UV light can travel uh, further to ionize these hydrogen atoms, uh, which are further away. And so you see uh, the UV lights, they can like penetrate through the ionized gas and reach the uh, neutral hydrogen atoms, atoms further away. And so these atoms will absorb the UV light that they receive and then get ionized. So in this case, we also say the, uh, the size of the ionized bubble, it grows larger because originally we have the ionized bubble that's 
uh, has a boundary like here, and now we have it here. And then of course there are going to be like more hydrogen atoms uh, that are mutual out here, uh, but I'm just not drawing them. And then uh, I'm, I'm just showing like the case of one galaxy here, but in the entire universe, there are uh, actually going to be a bunch of galaxies. So as I show here, I'm drawing like three galaxies uh, to represent uh, the case in the entire universe. Uh, of course, there's going to be like a lot of other galaxies, which I'm not drawing. Uh, so for each of these galaxies, they are going to have their own ionized bubble. And then inside the ionized bubble, the uh, hydrogen atoms will be ionized. Uh, and then in between uh, these ionized bubbles, the hydrogen atoms will be neutral. And then uh, as the stars, uh, as the galaxies continue to emit UV light, the size of the ions bubbles are going to grow larger. And then as I uh, clip between the uh, this slide and the next one, you see like uh, there are overlap in between the ions bubbles when the, when the bubbles grow larger. And then when the bubbles grow larger and overlap each other, more hydrogen atoms like this one and these uh, once they will be ionized. And then uh, if, uh, if we wait for a longer period of time, the bubbles are going to overlap even more. And so when it overlaps even more, you see that these hydrogen atoms, they are also ionized. And so we now only have these two left to be ionized. Uh, so eventually, if we, if we wait like long enough, all of the hydrogen atoms will be ionized. So this basically uh, marks the end of the reionization process. Uh, so uh, I'm only, again, I'm only representing the entire universe with like three galaxies, but uh, the actual story is that the universe is filled with galaxies. So all of these galaxies will contribute to the uh, reionization process and finally ionize the entire universe. Uh, so this is basically a simplified uh, story of how reionization occurred throughout the universe. And now I'm going to show you a uh, computer simulation of the reionization process that I did uh, a few years ago. So in this uh, simulation that uh, we are going to see like uh, a more realistic picture of the reionization process. Uh, so let's play this movie. Uh, but uh, actually, first of all, let me mention that the redder the color is, the more neutral the gas is. And then the bluer color uh, will represents the ionized gas. And so as time evolves, we see that we have uh, galaxies forming here and here. And then um, there are bluer regions around these galaxies, which means they have their, their own ionized bubbles. And then there are more galaxy fo galaxies forming here and here. And they also create their own ionized bubbles. And now you see the bubbles, they grow larger and overlap each other. And here there's only uh, this tiny bit of a neutral region to be ionized. And then as time evolves more and more, you see like all of the gas in between galaxies, they're ionized. So the entire simulation volume, it becomes blue. And then um, let me just mention like the difference between uh, this more realistic simulation and the uh, simplified picture that we mentioned before. So like as we play this movie, uh, first thing we notice is that the ionized bubbles, these are not spherical, uh, but uh, when I showed the simplified, simplified version of reionization before, I actually draw like spherical bubbles around these galaxies. So the reason why um, the, bubbles, the bubbles are not spherical is because the density of the uh, gas is not uniform. If the gas is like uniform density, then certainly the uh, the bubbles will be like spherical. But here you actually see that this these gas will be like higher density compared to these gas, and higher density means that the gas is uh, more difficult to be ionized uh, because the gas will actually like protect the inner regions from being ionized, uh, and then you have to like. Uh, hit the gas really hard to make it uh, completely ionized. So you see this kind of a, uh, actually a butterfly shape of the ionized bubble. Uh, so this is the, the first um, 
difference from the simplified version. And then uh, the second um, difference from the simplified version, which is something I also didn't really talk about, is that at the end of the reanalyzation process, uh, which is basically like here, you see uh, there's still this kind of a uh, red-ish region, uh, actually like uh, filament-like regions in the universe that are uh, not exactly ionized. Uh, and the reason, uh, which I actually just briefly mentioned before, these are the higher density regions. And this is what we call the, uh, the self-shielding of the gas. Uh, and the, uh, the reason why this occurs, um, you can sort of think about, um, uh, it may not be a very great example, but it's uh, the closest example I can think of. So uh, there's the story about the ants uh, in the forest. Um, so when there's a like a wildfire happening in the forest, uh, the ants were like they gathered around the river because they're there because of the fire, and then they had to like cross the river so that they are uh, they're safe uh, from the fire. But then the ants they absolutely uh, fear the fire. Uh, sorry, they, they fear the water. So what they do is that they sort of formed a ball of ants. And then they just roll uh, across the river. So, like as you can imagine, in this process, the the ants at the surface level of the of the ball they are going to drown, of course, uh, and they're going to die. But the ants at the uh, inner part of the ball they are not going to die because they are protected from the outer layer of the ants that are absolutely dead. Uh, so that's kind of the story that ha uh, happens here. Uh, the reason, uh, the story here is just that the density of the gas is so high that the outer region of the gas, it protects the inner gas from being ionized, but the outer uh, region of the gas, it is ionized. Uh, so that's kind of the story here. Uh, and then I also have to mention, like, uh, we talked about at the beginning of this uh, part of the talk um, about star formation, about um, actually structure formation in the universe. Uh, starting from the points where the universe is like having only tiny uh, density fluctuations. So that's roughly here, even though I'm not really showing the, the density field, the, the map of the uh, density di distribution. But uh, the reason why these galaxies can form is because of the uh, density fluctuations and the, the gravitational force that pulls everything, everything together. So as, you, as we evolve through time, um, these galaxies are, are really forming at the density peaks of the universe and then emit light and then uh, ionize everything in the universe or almost everything. Yeah, so that's basically um, the story here I want to tell. Uh, and then just to uh, end this story, uh, end this part of the talk with a uh, fancier version. Uh, I'm going to show a uh, a very uh, brief piece of the uh, of my dancer PhD video. So let me play this. Here. So what I'm doing here is that I'm representing uh, hydrogen atoms with the fan, and then I am representing the UV light myself. So you see me interacting with a hydrogen atom, which is the, the fan, and then I throw the fan away to represent um, ionizing the hydrogen. And then the story is when all of the hydrogen are ionized in the universe, the UV light is actually free to travel because ionized hydrogen doesn't uh, absorb UV light. Yeah, so uh, I'm not going to show more because the whole video is like seven minutes, but if you're interested, you can absolutely look it up. Uh, and then, yeah, so this is a brief summary of the second part. Uh, so basically what we believe uh, about uh, the epoch of reionization is that the formation of the first stars and galaxies they emitted the UV light that 
uh, traveled throughout the universe, uh, which is actually a, a continuous battle between the UV light and the neutral hydrogen atoms. And then eventually, if we wait for like a few hundred million years, we see that all of the hydrogen atoms in the universe are ionized. And, and that gives us the hot and high, uh, ionized state of the gas in between galaxies that we see today. So let me uh, just stop here and take questions. That was great. Your dance was very beautiful. Uh, we do have one question from James on YouTube. And he asks, can galaxies form an ionized gas? Which is something I know that you'll talk about in the next section. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they absolutely can. Um, yeah, so yeah, I, I am indeed going to talk about it in the next section. Um, so the story is actually that the, um, the condition of star formation is very different from like the, the, the condition of the gas in between galaxies, because in order for stars to form, you actually need like extremely dense uh, gas. Uh, so for instance, the, the density of the center of the sun is like, uh, I actually just looked the number up on my phone. Um, I think it's roughly about maybe 10 to the 29 or 30-ish. Uh, atoms per cubic centimeter. So that is extremely different from like one atom per cubic meter in the diffuse gas of the uh, in-between galaxies. And the uh, complete story have to deal with uh, how gas info in, uh, onto galaxies and then how this very diffuse galaxy, they sort of uh, collapse more and more to form stars. So it is, it is like a very long story, yeah. But eventually, when you when the when the ionized gas they like they are like collapsed more and more. There's also the uh, what we call the cooling of the gas, and when the gas cools down, it is also going to like uh, become denser to form stars, and also uh, become neutral again. So yeah, it is it is like a very complicated story. Great. And then we also have another question from Lois. Uh, where did the UV light come from? Uh, was it before or after the Big Bang? Oh, it's, um, it is after the Big Bang uh, because we, uh, it is uh, roughly shown here, like the first stars, it formed after the Big Bang about a few hundred million years uh, later. And then uh, it is because uh, the UV light actually comes from the stars. Uh, actually from the, in, uh, the very inner part of the stars where the, uh, the, the, nuclear, the, the nuclear fusion uh, takes, uh, takes place. Uh, and then the stars will emit the UV light to ionize the, the hydrogen. And then we also had one more question from Katrina. Um, was dancing your PhD, was that a required project? And she's also wondering what that experience was like. Oh, that's absolutely not required. It, it's just, um, uh, I am an amateur ballet dancer. So I did this um, like just out of my own interest. And also because I, I want to end my PhD with, a, uh, with, with, my, with my ballet, uh, like in this way, uh, I'm, I'm graduating this year. Yeah, so this is like saying a proper goodbye. Fantastic. All right. If we don't have any more questions right now, we'll take another few minutes break and we'll come back at 7.25 to finish the talk, the third and final part. All right, it is 725. So let's get started with the third and final part of this talk. Okay. 
Yeah, so finally in this part, um, I'll introduce uh, how we actually study reionization and uh, what does it tell us about galaxy formation. Uh, and we are finally going back to this question uh, about the ultrafaint dwarfs, like what actually stopped uh, star formation in these galaxies 13 billion years ago. And the answer has to do with reionization. Uh, but first of all, let me just quickly recap about the reionization process. So reionization is basically a battle between the uh, UV lights and the hydrogen atoms. And then what emits the UV lights are the galaxies. Uh, so first of all, let's talk about how we study reionization observationally. Uh, so observationally, I mean, using telescopes uh, or telescope-like things. Um, yeah, so there are basically two ways. One way is to, we can uh, observe the galaxies that reionize the universe. Uh, and then the second way is to actually observe the neutral gas itself. Uh, so the first one is obviously easier. Uh, so I'm going to mention that first. Uh, so here's a movie actually showing the Hubble field, which is extremely cool. Uh, and then what we do is that uh, we just pick like a tiny patch of the sky and then take extremely, extremely long exposure times so that we can really capture the most distant galaxy possible. And then that's what, the, uh, that's what you're basically seeing here. Like it's, it's really like zooming in a tiny region of the sky and then taking extremely long exposure times so that in the end you can like capture all these uh, amazing galaxies. Like all of these uh, points here like are individual galaxies, not stars anymore. So these galaxies are like are also like extremely far away because we are really uh, looking deep into the um, very distant universe. So if we do this kind of observation with like the galaxies that actually reionize the universe at the wavelengths that are not absorbed by neutral hydrogen, which means uh, this kind of wavelength then we can actually like take a picture of these uh, galaxies. Uh, so uh, what I'm also saying is that we cannot observe the galaxies in this part of the spectrum because these are the uh, lights that are uh, absorbed by neutral hydrogen. So we can't actually uh, take a picture with these lights, but uh, with this wavelength, uh, with this wavelength range, we can. Uh, so if we if we observe these galaxies at the wavelengths that are not absorbed by neutral hydrogen, uh, we can sort of uh, do some exercise, for instance, estimate how many stars are in these galaxies. And then based on this estimate, we can also estimate like how many hydrogen atoms can each of these galaxies ionize. Uh, with that estimate, we can sort of draw an ionized bubble around the galaxy. So what this is also saying is that uh, with this um, observation of the galaxies, we are basically deducing what was happening at reionization. Uh, and the reason why I say deducing is that I'm, uh, we are not really absorbing the reionization process like directly, but this is just an implicit, uh, yeah, an, an implicit way of um, studying reionization. And then another, another way to observe the reionization process is observing the gas. So the way this works is that uh, based on some crazy quantum mechanics calculations, the neutral hydrogen atom, uh, which is represented uh, again here, uh, it is able to absorb light at 21 centimeter wavelength. Uh, and this kind of absorption at 21 centimeter wavelength cannot actually happen on Earth because on Earth, uh, we can't really uh, achieve the kind of uh, very low density condition in the gas in between galaxies that we see in the universe, uh, which is one atom per cubic meter. So even with a, like, the best vacuum machine we have on Earth, we cannot achieve that kind of condition. So we can't actually make the 21 centimeter 
um, absorption happen. But in the very extreme condition of the universe, uh, this kind of thing can actually happen. And we expect it to uh, be seen using telescope observations. So this 21 centimeter wavelength is roughly uh, located here. So this is kind of the, uh, the radio wavelength. And then what uh, if we do this kind of observation at the 21 centimeter wavelength, what we are basically doing is we are taking a picture of the neutral gas. So for instance, if we uh, if the uh, if the gas in the universe sort of like look like the 3D volume shown by the right hand plot here, then uh, if we take a picture of the neutral gas, then we are basically going to see in our telescope the red regions in this box. Uh, the problem with this kind of observations is that it is extremely, extremely hard. Uh, and then um, if you go to like a radio telescope, uh, I mean, if you go to the site, uh, you are very likely to be banned from using cell phone. Uh, and in addition to like cell phone, there are other kind of noise that the radio telescope um, receive. For instance, uh, if you have just a car passing by, that's going to cause like a noise as well. So 21 centimeter observations is extremely hard. And people have been building instruments for like over 20 years, but there's no, um, not very much success up to now. Uh, if you go to Berkeley, uh, these people are like building instruments and they will tell you uh, they are very optimistic that they will, that they will get some data in a few years. Uh, but uh, my advisor is very pessimistic about it. So I'm a bit pessimistic, uh, but anyways, uh, since it is so hard to study reionization observationally with 21 centimeter observations, uh, in my research, I use a uh, simpler, ver simpler version to study reionization, which is running computer simulations of reionization. Uh, and then in my simulations, I'm basically going to um, include all the things that we talked about uh, in the last two parts of, the uh, of this talk, uh, which includes uh, st uh, structure formation from the very beginning of the universe where there is only tiny uh, fluctuations in the uh, density distribution of the universe. And then um, we have gravity, which uh, pulls the uh, matter of the universe towards the denser parts of the universe so that we can have star and galaxy formation. And then uh, these uh, galaxies will emit UV light. The UV light will battle with the hydrogen atoms and then uh, after a very, very long fight, the hydrogen atoms in the universe will all be ionized. And so uh, this movie is not something I run, uh, but I show it because it is visualized in 3D. So it's nicer than my own visualization that I showed in part two. Uh, but basically here, what you're seeing is that uh, these green, uh, sorry, the, the blue regions, these are the ionized bubbles around galaxies, uh, which are not really shown in, in this uh, 3D volume, but you know they're, they're there. And then the bubbles will grow larger and larger and overlap each other, as we talked about in part two. And, uh, and the overlap will be like growing more and more so that more and more uh, hydrogen atoms are ionized. And then eventually you see like the entire universe become transparent, which means uh, all of the gas is ionized and then the gas will allow the UV light to go through because the ionized gas uh, does not absorb um, the UV light. Yeah, so so uh, those are the people that's created the simulation. Yeah, so now we can actually return to the topic of the ultra faint dwarfs and uh, really talk about what reionization tell us about galaxy formation. Yeah, so um, um, all these uh, has to do with like what I mentioned uh, at, the, at, the, at the first part, the, the heating of the gas due to the ionization process. So just a quick recap. Uh, when ionization happens, the gas absorb the energy of the UV light, 
And when the gas does that, uh, the energy that they absorb will become the uh, motion of the uh, electrons and proton in the gas. So the gas become very hot uh, of order like uh, 10,000 degrees Celsius. So this is like orders of magnitudes hotter than um, when the gas is neutral. So that was, that was roughly about minus 100 or minus, minus 100 to plus 100 degrees Celsius. Um, so uh, the next thing I want to talk about is how um, the cold and gas, uh, sorry, the, the, hold and, uh, the cold and hot states uh, affect the, the um, galaxy formation process. Uh, and to illust illustrate that, so this is uh, going to show a movie about um, how the, the motion of particles um, affect their info onto a um, massive object. So uh, what this is doing is that they use this sort of a, a, a cloth to represent like uh, when there is a massive object, uh, it has a um, gravitational force. So it's, um, pushes the, the cloth downwards. And then the, if, you, if you put something on the cloth, it will be like uh, pushed towards the, the massive object because of gravity. So this is uh, basically illustrates um, what we also call the gravitational potential well. Uh, so what you're seeing here is that if this uh, white thing, it does not have a very large uh, initial velocity, then it'll be pulled towards this massive object here. So let me, let me just quickly play this again. Like it'll go around this object for like circles after circles, but eventually it is going to hit the central uh, magenta object because of the, the gravity that um, the magenta object has. And the gravity is sort of illustrated by the, the shape of this cloth. And then uh, conversely, if we have like very uh, fast moving, um, if we have a fast moving ball uh, as, uh, as illustrated by this part of the movie here, you can see this ball is not, uh, it's not like pulled into the, the thing at the center anymore because the motion is like really fast that it can actually escape the gravitational potential, like escape the, the gravity pull of the, the central object. Yeah, so basically what all this is saying is that when the gas is hot, which basically means the uh, protons and electrons, they are allowed to like move very fast, then they have a very high probability of not being pulled into galaxies. Uh, and conversely, when the gas is cold, which means the hydrogen atoms, they move very slowly, then they have like way higher probabilities of being pulled into the, the gravitational potential of the galaxies. Uh, and uh, the reason why I mentioned about the like hydrogen atoms being pulled into galaxies is that um, star formation actually came from the info of the gas in between galaxies onto the, the galaxies. So um, again, I'm showing like this uh, pillars of creation image. So all these gas that fuel star formation actually originally came from the, uh, the diffuse gas in between galaxies. So it has to do with like the diffuse galaxies in between galaxies, uh, the diffuse gas in the universe in between galaxies being pulled onto this central galaxy. And then uh, there's the sort of uh, mixing and collapsing and finally uh, star formation uh, in, inside these galaxies. And so if there is no, um, info of the diffuse gas onto galaxies, then there is no star formation, which is basically saying if that, um, if the gas is like really hot, uh, then um, as, you've, as you have seen in this movie, 
the gas will not be pulled onto the galaxies. So then we will very likely have a uh, uh, the stopping of star formation, which we also call like the quenching of star formation. And that's basically the, the story that's happening in these ultra faint dwarfs. The, the, uh, the problem is that these galaxies, they are, um, uh, they are so, um, how should I say this, um, not massive, uh, because these galaxies, they only have like a few thousand stars. So the gravity that these a few thousand stars uh, they have is like extremely low. So they will not be able to like uh, really pull the uh, hot gas uh, in between galaxies onto them. So re when reionization occurs, these galaxies are basically going to stop uh, star formation because the gas becomes really hot um, because of star formation. No, sorry, because of reionization. So uh, after reionization, um, they are not the uh, they are not able to pull the gas in, and then star formation just will not occur anymore. And that's for the reason why star formation stopped when uh, reionization finishes, like uh, thirteen billion years ago. Uh, and conversely, um, these very massive galaxies, like the spiral ones, uh, they have about a trillion stars. Uh, they, they are like extremely massive. So they have like very large gravity that can actually pull the gas in, even if the gas is very hot and not being able, uh, not able to like being pulled by the gravitational potential of these very low mass galaxies. So these galaxies, they are, are still able to pull the gas in and so they can continue star formation. So this basically tells us the reason why uh, the galaxies are so different today. Uh, and the reason is because of reionization. Yeah, so um, I think I've uh, talked about most of the things and then I just wanna end the talk with like uh, very beautiful simulations of uh, galaxy formation. Um, so this simulation is actually not going to show like the reionization process uh, with the reionization bubbles that, but it's only going to show like the very beautiful galaxy formation. And then uh, I just wanna share what is with you. And it also includes uh, everything we've talked about. Like for instance, uh, structure formation from the very beginning of the universe where there's only like tiny density fluctuations. So this is actually showing the dark matter uh, and I didn't really say about this, but dark matter makes up most of the uh, matter in the universe, but like uh, the actual gas that we know about is like a tiny fraction of the total matter in the, uni in the universe. And then you see like uh, the density peaks of the, of the universe, they are going to like uh, pull uh, a large fraction of the matter uh, towards them. And now the movie is going to transition to showing the, uh, the temperature of the gas. And then the, the redder the color is, the higher the temperature of the gas is. And then as the movie goes on, you also see this kind of a explosion feature. And this is because of the explosion of the stars when the star dies, uh, which you also have heard about like uh, supernova explosions. And this is what we also call the feedback of star formation because of the explosion. Like uh, when, the, uh, when the star explodes, it expels the gas out of the galaxies. So that's why we call feedback. And then this is showing what we call the, uh, the metals in the universe. Uh, basically metal just means everything that is not hydrogen and helium in astronomy. And the reason why we care about metals is that there are no metals in the universe at the beginning uh, after the Big Bang. So after the Big Bang, there's only hydrogen and helium. And then it is because of nuclear fusion in, uh, inside the stars that made these uh, metals. And, and that's also the reason why we exist. So you've probably heard of it, like uh, we are all stardust. And again, this is showing uh, the dark matter distribution again. Uh, and this is actually the 
end of the simulation uh, at the at the present day, the uh, about 14 billion years after the Big Bang. So here, um, what this is showing is the uh, kind of a visualization of the visual galaxies. So you see, this is like translating the, the density of the dark matter to actual galaxies. And you see this kind of a shape that looks like galaxies, even though it's um, not like perfect. Yeah, but this is also like what you would actually observe with telescopes like Hubble. So yeah, this is the end of the simulation. And then yeah, hope you really enjoyed it. And then yeah, that's basically the end of the talk. And then uh, yeah, at the third part, we basically talked about uh, how we study realization, also uh, both observationally and theoretically. And then uh, we talked about the most important thing, uh, why galaxies are so different and uh, how reionization contributed to this. Yeah, so that's the end of the talk. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can feel free to ask. Uh, and also, um, yeah, if you are interested in my downstairs PhD video, please look it up. Fantastic, that was fascinating. Uh, we have a question from James on YouTube. Um, are there any galaxies that formed after reionization? Yeah, yeah, there are absolutely those ones too. Uh, so the uh, condition of galaxy formation depends on like uh, how uh, how large the density peak in the universe is. Uh, so like I like I mentioned, the galaxies they form on the density peaks of the universe, and then the larger the the size of the density peak is the uh, the larger the uh, the resulting galaxy is. So imagine like if you have a very massive density peak, then that is uh, absolutely able to like pull the gas inside it. So the collapse can happen and then star formation can happen. Yeah, so as long as you have like such large density peaks, then yes, you can have um, galaxy formation throughout the entire uh, evolution of the universe. Great. And then Katrina is wondering, why do galaxies make a spiral shape? Oh, oh my God, that, that's a very good question. Um, it has to do a very crazy theory called the, uh, let me see, um, I think it's called the density wave. Like uh, that is uh, extremely, complicated and I also, um, I'm not familiar with that theory, but it is called the density wave. Great. And then while we're waiting to see if we have any other questions, I was wondering like, what really excites you about this research? What made you want to pursue a PhD? Oh, uh, yeah, that's a great question. I ended up doing this topic uh, for a, like just out of random. Yeah, like I, I picked up this topic from a few other topics and then uh, continued doing this for like four years. Yeah, but it's, it's really like at the beginning of my PhD, I like seriously, uh, how can a first year student know about astronomy research? Yeah, so I, I just pick it up things at random. Awesome. Thank you. That was a fantastic talk. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Great talk. We had um, two, two comments on the YouTube. James says, uh, thank you, great talk. And Jeff says, fantastic lecture, very clearly explained. Thanks. Yeah, hope is clear.